Welcome everyone to our session today on Telemental Health 101 through the tiers. We're coming today, we are part of the National Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and the University of Maryland School Mental Health Program. My name is Nancy Lieber. I co-direct the National Center for School Mental Health and I'm joined today by Jennifer Cox who is the amazing program director mm -hmm. for our University of Maryland School Mental Health Program. I'm also going to have Jessica introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Dyer with California School-Based Health Alliance and I will be moderating today. Thank you, Jessica. We would like everyone, if you could take a moment to introduce yourself, if you can put in the chat box your name, your role and your organization that will help give us a sense of who is joining us today so that we can make sure that we are targeting today's presentation to best meet your needs. And while you're typing in that, um, I am a clinical psychologist and Jen is a licensed social worker. We have been working as part of our University of Maryland School Mental Health Program for many years and have prior to the pandemic for, gosh, since 2000. And Jen, when did we first start doing telemental? 2014. 2014, we have been doing telemental health for some time. I would say we did a great job before. We have a lot more practice at it now and we're excited to be able to share some information with you. Um, we have uh, Belinda, who is the Manager of Service Coordination with HealthNet Medi-Cal Managed Care on today. Um, we have uh, Kate Wood, who's a Behavioral Health Clinician at School-Based Health Clinic in Oakland. Um, we have Lindsay, who's a District Nurse. Um, we've got some MST intern uh, MST right. and school counseling interns, some LMFTs, um, clinical director, so a number okay. of clinicians. Excellent. I would say today's presentation should be, should be relevant for all of you. And if you have questions as we're going along, please be sure to type them in the chat box. One of the things we'd like to get a sense of is if you could rate your familiarity with telemental health in schools. So if you use the chat box on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you with using telemental health services? Zero is the lowest level of comfort and 10 is the highest. So if you can use your chat box and put your rating in there, that would be great. Some people saying about a five. Okay. Okay, well, what I can promise is by the end of this presentation and with the ideas that we're sharing, these should help you to improve your comfort level. As I mentioned, five we're the part average. average. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, we are part of the National Center for School Mental Health. We're at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. We are funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration. And we've been continuously funded as a center since 1995. We have our focus to advance research, training, policy, and practice in school mental health, and are really working on integrating a shared family school community mental health agenda. Um, in terms of our mission, our goal is to strengthen policies and programs in school mental health to improve learning and to promote success for America's youth. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of resources available on our website, schoolmentalhealth.org. We develop and share a tre tremendous amount of resources if your budget is zero for doing school mental health, but we are a good fit for you. Everything that we have posted is available at no cost. And our goal really is to get this information out to you. Our goal is to help as many students as we can by providing high quality 
school mental health services. We also have added um, two tabs to our website recently, and one is specific to resources on COVID-19. And we also have added a cultural responsiveness and equity tab. And you know, I highly encourage you to check out these resources. And we really try to put on some ha hands-on practical resources that you can apply within the school setting. So let's begin with just some basics before I turn things over to Jen, who'll be going into some of the more specifics about telemental health and sharing some best practice strategies. Let's make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what is telemental health. Telemental health, it's also referred to as teletherapy, telepsychiatry, is the use of video conferencing to provide mental health care or education at a distance. Interactions are using live audio and video. And you know, typically you could have a, an example of this, you could have a clinician and a student having an online session in real time, group sessions, family sessions, consultation with a specialist. Essentially you can use telemental health to provide the same level of clinical services that we were providing previously prior to um, the pandemic. In terms of what telemental health could look like, this would show a mental health provider who is in one location speaking with a family member who is located in another location. Traditionally, when we first started with our telemental health services, that we would have our provider, often a psychiatrist working from our university setting, and we would have a clinician with a youth or family in our school setting. But the same model can work when you are providing services from a clinician maybe in their own home working with a youth or family member who is in their own home. So one of the things that becomes important is to make sure that you're understanding the lingo. When we, as we're presenting today, when we're talking about the originating site, we're referring to wherever the client is located. That could be in the school setting at home. The distant site is the therapist location. And again, that can vary as well. So why telemental health? You know, one of the things that we have found with telemental health is it, and probably the most important reason for using telemental health is that it really improves access to care. We know that it can be quite challenging to get providers to um, different locations. And especially in some of our more rural communities, they may not have access to some of the specialty care. And it's a way to get um, specialty services to directly to a school or other setting. We also know that with workforce shortages, if you only have X amount of time for a provider that's available, if that provider is spending time driving from one school to another, that could take up a considerable amount of time compared to they could, each hour could potentially be on or each half hour could potentially be on with a different provider location. Um, you know, it's definitely convenient. It's caught, there's cost savings. It's not as expensive to have to get one person from one place to another. Um, we know that our students and families like it. There's high satisfaction ratings. And for some of our youth, they actually prefer telemental health and feel comfortable um, using the technology. Our multidisciplinary teams can be in multiple settings and come together at once. So, you know, even I know independent of telemental health, some of the meetings that I've been a part of over the last six months. Some of them are actually having higher attendance because without people having to commute to the meeting, they're more available to participate. And we'll talk as we go forward about you know, when might telemental health be more challenging and um, with safety concerns, student refusal. Jen will be talking more about that in the next section. But what is the evidence? I mean, the great news is that we know that telemental health services, it's very feasible to provide them um, online. And 
they can be used and well accepted and work effectively across the developmental age and to youth with a variety of disorders. Um, and the early work is really suggesting that the outcomes are similar to whether to the outcomes achieved and the satisfaction level are similar to when delivered in person. So that's great news that we can do this and our youth and families like it and seem to the services seem to have similar impact. One of the things um, that we found in the research is that there are high satisfaction ratings for receiving um, telemental health care. We have, we know that we're able to establish rapport. It, you know, you're using different skills. Jen's going to talk a lot about the different skill sets, but at the end of the day, we're using the core skills of mental health. We just might be pulling, you know, using different muscles to be able to provide these services using the technology. And in terms of safety, we know that we can also address through telemental health safety plans um, and come up with strategies so that we can ensure the safety of the youth and family that we're working with and can decide when this is an appropriate strategy to use and when it might not be. One of the things, as I've mentioned, we've been doing this since 2014. Our youth and families have been more accepting of telemental health than some of our clinicians, our, our, our doctors, our psychiatrists. They ultimately have become more comfortable with it, but many of them come with some preconceptions that this is not gonna work, that you won't be able to establish rapport, that they're not comfortable, that they have to get used to the technology um, and how to, how to be as effective. So they express some um, less satisfaction, mostly with their own performance. But what we have found is when we are giving them some, of, some new strategies to try, and some of those strategies we're gonna be sharing with you today, the satisfaction level was able to increase as they became more comfortable. And you know, always look to the words of our students. This is a very good and great idea. The students really like this. And let me turn things over to Jen. Great, thank you, Nancy. So again, you really keep that in mind and let that sink in for a minute as we think about the research again that you know, our clients were happy with it, our caregivers were happy with telemental health, but it was the providers that weren't. And so that's why I think it's so important to, you know, attend as many of these trainings as you can and get really comfortable with tele. Um, because again, we're, our research is telling us that it is just as effective as, as in person, um, but it's us, it's, it's the providers who just need to be a little more flexible. And we really need to look to ourselves and do a little bit more work um, ourselves just to be comfortable with it because they like it. Again, our students are doing things. They're, they're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is. So they're very used to this digital world. Um, so we really hope that today, you know, we're gonna, we can give you some practical, practical pointers to help you feel more confident so that you will be more confident being a telemental health practitioner. So before we get started, we just wanted to review some of the tiers of a comprehensive or a complete um, school mental health service system. So some of you may have seen this model before and you may have only seen the top three tiers, but we really wanted to emphasize also, you know, and I strongly believe that we also need to make sure that there's some focus on the bottom two tiers. So the bottom two tiers, you'll also see professional development and support for a healthy school workforce. So we're talking about our teachers and our even our school social workers and psychologists, you know, are, are folks that really support our students every day. And then after that, our family school community partnerships. Um, our family school community partnerships would be any relationships or partnerships that you have with like a food bank or a um, local youth center or church, um, especially during times when we're not able to be in school buildings and we're virtual. We need to lean on those folks to be our eyes and our ears um, to see, you know, what families might need. Um, so they could, you know, send a referral our way, but also to know those resources um, and what's in the community so that we can refer our clients there. So we'll be talking about that later on. Um, but again, um, in reviewing the top three tiers, you know, we have tier one, um, so it's promotion of positive social, emotional, and behavioral skills um, and overall wellness. So when we're talking about tier one services, 
we're really talking about um, interventions and services that serve the entire school. So promotion of positive, um, again, social emotional behavioral skills. So this could be something like PBIS or um, you know, any character building activity that might be going on that impacts everyone in the school. Tier two, um, we move up a little bit and that's more of our selective intervention, um, which are specialized groups maybe um, or systems for students with at-risk behavior um, and maybe are some of our students that are identified as needing early intervention or have those uh, risks that we wanna really address early. And then finally, we have our tier three. And again, that's the targeted interventions for students with really serious concerns or um, when a student has a mental health issue that's really getting in the way of their functioning. A lot of times we see these students either in more intense groups or um, in individual services. So we're gonna talk first a little bit about tips for individual sessions um, and that tier three level, but keep in mind that many of these tips can be used for all of the tiers um, throughout the program. So first of all, it's really important um, to think about selecting a telemental health platform. So as COVID hit us and a lot of folks transitioned to tele, um, many of these platforms such as Zoom or WebEx or DoxyMe offered free services, um, which was great because we needed to be very quick about doing it. Um, but as we all know, not, nothing usually stays free forever. Um, and so um, not only were they not free, they all weren't HIPAA compliant. So we wanted to make sure that when you're selecting a telemental health platform, you are considering a couple of things. First of all is cost, um, again, because they don't always stay free and some can be very expensive. So when you're first starting out with a platform, um, consider the cost and it, consider if that can be maintained. Um, it's really difficult for clients to switch platforms once they get um, used to one platform. So keep in mind um, that it, once you have it, you want to maintain it so they can be comfortable and feel like they can use Tele moving forward. Also consider the technology offered. Um, again, different platforms offer different um, features, you know, on some of them you can do polling or annotating or writing on the screen or sharing screen um, really easily. So um, consider what you want to do on Tela um, and if those options are available because, you know, like I said, they are different. And we want to make it user friendly. Uh, we want to make this as easy um, as, a, as a process for our clients and our, and our families as possible. Um, so when you're picking a telemental health platform, again, most of them are free to start, so you could try it out, see if it's easy to set up an appointment or use all of those features and see what it would look like from your client's end. Um, additionally, some are app-based while others are web-based. And so in considering your clients and thinking about do many of them have lap laptops or larger tablets or most of your clients and caregivers working off of their phone, it would be a consideration to think what might be easier. Most importantly, we want to think if our telemental health platform is HIPAA compliant and see what the ease is in setting up a business associate agreement or a BAA. So this is very, very, very important to remember that if you're doing clinical services, you need to have a BAA with the platform. Um, that ensures that, is a, that it's HIPAA compliant and that your sessions will be secure and confidential. So when preparing for teletherapy, again, you want to make sure you're using that approved platform. Um, if you're in, you're doing, um, you know, private practice or something, you can pick your own, but with, if you're with an agency or a school, they most likely have picked out a platform and you want to make sure that you're using that and only using that platform when delivering services. Always make sure that whatever you're using, whether it's your phone or your computer or a tablet, that it's plugged in. Um, this is so important um, because during teletherapy, it takes a lot of um, power and bandwidth to transmit your picture and your visual. And you wanna make sure that you're ensuring the best session possible. And so by doing those little things, by plugging in chargers and later, um, I think also we talk about plugging into the internet if you can, you um, leave all that you know, energy and bandwidth available for your session. And you, nobody wants to have your session end by your computer dying or your phone dying. Um, you know, that can be very frustrating for you and for your client. Also make sure you have a pretty clear plan for the session. Um, when we're in our offices, you know, we can get up, we can move around, we can grab items as we need them. 
but when you're conducting a teletherapy session, you're pretty much stuck in front of your computer um, depending on what you're doing. So having nearby what you're gonna need for the day, are there any materials that you wanna bring into the session? Um, are there websites or tools or games that you wanna have up in the background so that they can very quickly be accessed and shared with the client? Um, making sure you know what you're gonna do is important. Um, so again, you can you know, help your clients feel comfortable and um, them having, you, you being prepared just shows your confidence in doing it and helps them to feel comfortable too. Consider the background um, that you have. Um, you know, you may be working in a home office or in your own office, and you will be sharing your background um, no matter what. You're there, your clients are going to be able to see it. Do you have pictures in the background? Um, do you have artwork or, or things? You know, if you're in your house, is your house all cluttered? I, I would not want to share what's all in this room right now. <laughs> um, so you want to think, what can your clients see? Um, and if you don't want that shared with your client or caregivers, make sure that you are preparing that and setting it up. And then also that it looks professional. Um, try to keep your routine as consistent as you can. I know when I'm doing in-person sessions, I keep to a structure that is, um, you know, we start out with activity time uh, or talk time, then we have activity time, then we have play time. When I transition into my tele-sessions, I use that same structure. Again, in trying to bring um, that structure and that routine to our client and help them to feel comfortable with what we're doing and knowing what to expect and anticipate each session. I mentioned resources that you would wanna have nearby as the therapist, but also make sure that you're preparing families, you know, if you want them to have any pen or paper or crayon. Um, a lot of times, and some of us may know this just from doing virtual schools with virtual school with our kids, you know, it takes a lot sometimes to get a child ready and set up in front of the computer. And then if you're all of a sudden you're there and they're ready to go and the parents done a lot of work to get there, you don't want them, um, you don't want them to have to say, oh, can now you go grab this piece of paper or this pencil? And then they have to go running through the house and face all the distractions of that. So prepare ahead of time what you need. Um, additionally, always I, I always have some water nearby and some tissues, just again, things that you would normally might be able to get up for quickly. You wanna make sure that you're comfortable and ready to do your session. And then finally, making sure that you have a professional appearance. Um, I know during COVID, we've all been home in our yoga pants. Nobody wants to put on any professional clothing anymore. I get it. <laughs> but at least from the waist up, making sure that you still do have that professional appearance. And when picking your clothes, this is a little extra special consideration. Try to go with solid colors or something that has um, either kind of a bigger pattern or not so much of a pattern. Again, if we're talking bandwidth and transmitting your um, visual across the internet, anything with a pattern takes up more of that visual, um, takes up more of that bandwidth. And so if you do have a really busy pattern on your shirt or even in your background, you're taking up your bandwidth to transmit that when really we wanna save all of that for the quality of your sound and your visual um, as you do your session. So again, in considering the physical location, um, we really want to consider the physical location for both the provider and the client. Um, think about privacy. Um, like I mentioned, consider what your client is going to see, but also what might they hear? Do you have a pet in the home? Is somebody going to be mowing the lawn that day? Um, is, do you have work going on your house? There might be some loud banging or things like that. Um, you want to prepare your clients and your caregivers for those sounds or you know, any disruptions that might happen. Um, especially, for example, if you have a dog and you, you, um, the dog is being able to be heard during the session, you're not quite sure how your client's going to respond to that. Um, you know, if they have a phobia or a fear or just, you know, don't like dogs, um, you know, that can be very destruction, dis disrupted, um, disruptive and, um, you know, cause your client um, some distress. So keep those things in mind. And if you can prepare them for, the, prepare, prepare them for something like that. Um, it's better than catching them off guard later. Um, making sure that there's adequate lighting is really important. Um, you always wanna make sure the lighting in your room is well lit um, in addition to your clients. Um, but in your room isn't particularly important because a lot of clients are wondering what's around you and it can bring up some anxiety um, in a child that even maybe doesn't have anxiety already, but just wondering what's in the room. So if I was sitting in a dark room and you couldn't see what was behind me, 
Um, again, they might be wondering like, is there something back there? They might be trying to, you know, see what's back behind you. But by having a well-lit room, um, you're able to like create that sense of security for them um, and know that there's really no surprises back there. Um, again, this is the same thing on the client end, and we're going to talk a little bit later, but we will, we really should prompt our clients and caregivers to create that space um, in their homes if they are getting receiving services at home um, so that you can see also. Um, you do want to know who's behind them. You want to know if there's anybody else in the room um, in an effort, first of all, to minimize environmental distractions um, for you and for the client. And it's okay to give feedback and say, you know, I, I can hear this or I can see this. Are you okay with that? Um, walking our clients through teletherapy is a skill that we can develop, and um, I think they're very appreciative of it. Um, as you establish your therapeutic space, again, on both sides, you want to really make sure that you determine all um, people that are present in the student session. And if there's anybody that is in the room that might be off camera, you may consider asking them to join the session so you can see them or leaving the room completely. Um, if there are people in the room that you don't know about, that could really impact um, what your client might want to say, what they might want to share during sessions, and um, them being comfortable in the session. So you could also really give your client an opportunity to, you know, share what's around them. If it's okay with the caregiver and the client, um, I often have had clients, you know, pick up their computer and just walk around the space um, just to say, oh, here's, you know, a picture of so-and-so, or, you know, this is my living room, this is where I am. It's just a nice way to build rapport and to make everybody feel comfortable in the session. Um, and with that, if anybody else is in your room, um, if it's on your end, you also maybe have a psychiatrist or a trainee, an intern or something in the room, you wanna make sure that you're letting your client and caregiver know. And um, this is one of the first steps in building that, that trust and um, you know, building that therapeutic space. Um, you don't ever want them to be surprised by you know, finding out accidentally that there's another person in the room. And again, even on your end, trying to have those folks all on camera. And if you're comfortable with it, um, like I said, I'm currently not comfortable with it, but um, if you are comfortable with it, ready to do a session, um, you could actually give a tour of your space. And it's just another great way to build rapport. Um, I used to work with a psychiatrist. He was wonderful. We were doing tele and um, he would walk around the room. He'd show the pictures on the wall and it happened to be at a downtown space. And it was just kind of some older, you know, gentleman in a typical like university setting. And he would make fun of them a little bit, joke with the client. And it really helped to, you know, start off sessions and ease the client and, um, you know, again, build that rapport and using that humor. So if you are bringing any toys um, or resources to session, you know, just think about how distracting they may be or um, you know, how appropriate they may be, may be for the session. So try to avoid any distracting toys, anything that makes a lot of noise, that's wind up, that's moves, um, you know, even things with batteries that might run out of battery during the session, the child might be upset. Um, you know, any, I would say the simpler, the better as you're bringing any resources or things to session or asking the clients to bring them. Um, but consider though, now that we are using Tele, how can you integrate those online tools? We're gonna to be sharing a little bit later, a lot of online games. And I know a lot of times, you know, we would start sessions out by just playing a quick game or ending them with a, you know, card game or Candyland or something like that. Um, and even though we can't do that in person, there, there are tons and tons and tons of tools to be able to do that online. Um, so consider using them and again, using them as a rapport building activity. Eye contact can be a little tricky um, in Tela. A lot of times folks are taking notes or trying to do something else. And a lot of times we wanna look at the screen and the client may be like lower down or in a different space on the screen. So try alternating your gaze in between the camera and the screen, just to make it feel a little bit more comfortable so that your client doesn't see you looking down the whole time or um, you wanna to try to you know, have that feel of actual eye to eye contact, even though we don't have it you know, in reality. Additionally, try to keep your image on the screen if it's not too distracting for you. I know a lot of people say, you know, I definitely don't wanna look at myself all day long. I just can't do it. And then they find themselves fixing their hair or whatnot. Um, but it's important for you to also monitor your body language and also your um, placement in the screen. 
Um, sometimes we might reach for something and, you know, bump our screen or something may happen. And we want to make sure we're aware of that. So we're not awkwardly doing a session and our screen has moved and we don't know it. So with that said, with that said, we need to, you know, know that staging matters. Um, we need to do a little bit of work when we're setting up and setting up our visual on the screen. Um, we really want to consider framing yourself so that your eyes are about one third from the top of the screen. So just imagine that you um, cut your screen into thirds, top third, middle third, bottle, bottom third. So if you have your eyes about one third um, from the top of the screen, and we found that that's the most comfortable way for people to view you. Um, it's comfortable for your, for your clients and your patients. Um, and it allows also for um, most of your body to take up the screen and for less distractions in the background. Also helps with the eye contact also and just eliminating all of those distractions. Here you can see a few examples, um, you know, where you might want to, you know, consider things. So um, this visual right here is very pleasant. Um, her eyes are about one third of the screen. Um, there's not much behind her that could be distracting, you know, the bottle of hand sanitizer and some tissues, you know, that's pretty much about it. Um, if you look at these other visuals though, you can see here that the lighting, um, there must be a desk lamp on. And so the light's coming from one area. Um, so it's really casting a shadow on the side of her face. Um, try to avoid that. It, it is distract, distracting um, and just takes away from the session. Um, in this visual here, as I mentioned earlier, she looks like she's looking down, maybe taking some notes, and it's just not as engaging. Um, here you can see more of her body. She's a little further back. Um, it makes it just a little bit more difficult um, to engage and catch those facial expressions. And so again, we really want to try to take up the screen here and have about one third from the top of the screen. As I mentioned, um, you want to self monitor if you can keep your image on screen, um, but also make sure that you're using more of those nonverbal gestures more more intentionally. Um, this really helps to build rapport. And we always say we give the we give the advice to be 110% of yourself. So people talk about how Zoom fatigue is real. And I think that teletherapy, you know, there's some teletherapy fatigue too, because it does take a little bit more energy. Um, you're monitoring yourself, you're monitoring the client, and you're also trying to be 110% of yourself. You've got to be a little bit more extra. We do things, you know, we can do word virtual high fives, you know, fist bumps, we're giving those tours. We can also share artwork. Um, you can do all kinds of things to build rapport, but you really do have to bring that extra energy. And really, nobody wants this guy looking back at them, right? We say try to avoid that technique base. Um, and also, it's technique base, but it's also sometimes we find ourselves on tele, you know, trying to get close and like squinting our eyes, thinking, you know, we're trying to see something in the background. But consider what your view is. And again, by having your visual on screen, um, that will kind of help avoid some of this stuff and, and help you realize what your visual looks like too. So um, one of the tips we always give is to take some tips from the pros. So if you turn on your favorite morning show or talk show and you put it on mute, you will notice that these folks are moving around a lot more. They are smiling a lot more um, than you would in person. You know, they're using a lot more of their facial features. So check them out, check it out. Um, they've received something that's called media training. If you ever can get a free media training, you know, I absolutely recommend doing it. Um, but there are some real things that keep clients engaged and, and that's why they do it for TV personalities. So as I mentioned, you really do wanna bring it. You know, you've gotta bring that extra umph. Um, you've gotta be engaging. You've gotta be exciting on, on, um, when you're on camera, but remember still to, to speak clearly and slowly. Um, some other therapy, Tips that we um, use are to using humor, you know, make sure you're repeating your lines if you think that something wasn't understood. Um, try to be creative engaging the student. There are all kinds of things you can do besides online resources too or giving tours. Um, I feel like my clinicians are coming up with new things every day. Um, the same psychiatrist I was talking about before, um, one of the things he used to do is he'd Google like the coolest dance move of the year, whatever it was. Um, and he was kind of a kind of a dorky guy, 
but um, he would just Google it and teach it to himself and then show the kids. And it was hysterical. I mean, I was engaged, the kids were engaged, um, but I thought it was really creative. Um, he was trying to, trying to figure it out and the kids would try to teach him, but it's great. Um, but there will be distractions and things will come up through your sessions. And most distractions, you can just kind of, we say, ride the wave of that distraction. Um, those things will pass. You know, kids will look out the window or look over to something in the room. Um, somebody may talk to them during the session. And those things can very easily be um, gotten over by just trying to bring them back or ignoring them um, or praising whenever you can. Um, you know, letting your client know when they're doing a good job on their telesession, when they're sitting still, um, paying attention, answering questions well. Same thing that you would do in person. So some tips for before the session starts, um, keeping in mind too, if you are working at home, there are things that you wanna um, you know, put in place. One of them is you know, things like um, your Alexa devices, right? So your dots, your echoes, things like that. Um, I always unplug those. Those are made for listening. Um, you know, not that I think they may be you know, listening in your therapy sessions, but we wanna really make sure that we're covering all of our bases to keep things confidential. Um, and it makes it really hard if you have a client named Alexa and it keeps going off or it picks up something and it starts to talk. So turn off all your smart devices, um, close all the browsers that you're not going to use during the session. Um, if in between sessions you're, you know, looking at Facebook or, you know, on Amazon shopping or doing whatever, um, keep in mind that if you're leaving those tabs open, those again are sucking up your bandwidth and you want to use that bandwidth for your sessions. Um, if possible, if you have them, use wired or wireless headphones. Um, most headphones now are noise canceling, and that really helps on those noises. So if somebody is mowing the lawn or there's a light construction project going on, um, it's really helpful to have those headphones on to block out those noises um, so they're not getting through into your session. We've mentioned plugging directly into the internet if possible, and also plugging in your computer so that you have that electricity and all of your, your bandwidth. And additionally, using the same space each time. So any of my telesessions, I would use this room. Um, and my clients know that they're gonna see this pretty boring white flat background. There's, there's nothing else back there to look at. Um, but for example, if I were to move my session, you know, the following week to my kitchen and then the week after that to my dining room, um, you know, kids and everybody, we're all nosy, right? We wanna see what's going on in somebody's home or in their background. So we're gonna be looking and um, it would just take that much more time to get used to that space and you know, get the session moving when you would have to orient somebody to a new space each time. So try to, have this, the, try to be in the same space each time or use one of the virtual backgrounds. As I mentioned, um, have websites or resources available and make sure if you're working um, with children and you're having caregivers into the session that you're planning for that participation ahead of time. Um, the great thing about Tala too is, you know, if, the, the child is in one location, the parent could even be in another location. And then, you know, all three of you could be in a telesession, even though you could be in, you know, three different cities across the state. Um, but you want to make sure that you're planning for that, whether the caregiver is somewhere else or if they're in the home and then they're coming at the beginning or the end of the session and planning how you're going to connect that caregiver in. During the session, we mentioned a few of these things, you know, allowing time for his um, a tour um, and helping the family develop um, some sort of privacy. Um, but also during the session, if you have multiple people in your sessions, make sure that you are, you know, using names as much as possible. As we know that eye contact is not as apparent. So if you are talking to a caregiver or a child, you would want to use their name when speaking to them, say, hey, mom, or, you know, or hey, Sally, um, use their names more frequently so that they know who you're talking to and there's just no question um, about trying to figure that out on their end. Again, we mentioned coaching our families. You know, you can explain where to look. You know, some kids just don't realize that, you know, there's a little camera on the top. Um, they don't realize that that's the camera that you have to look into um, to really be seen. Um, and you could teach them how to either be on screen or be off screen. Um, you know, some of those things can be very effective um, in helping them navigate that online session. Make sure as always you're using time checks, you know, and you're tech checking in about technology um, and letting clients know and giving them permission to interrupt you. If maybe your, you know, your session blips or they can't hear you or things like that, letting folks know that they can speak up and say, hey, you know, Ms. Jen, I can't hear you. Can, 
can you hold on a second? We're having an internet connection issue or you know, I didn't hear what you said. Um, very important is give permission to interrupt um, whenever they feel like they need to. Um, again, you can use the screen shares or PowerPoints also throughout sessions. Um, you know, a lot of folks really, you know, especially our trainees I see now like preparing um, PowerPoint sessions so it's easier to walk through um, and it's also easy for them to prepare um, their sessions. And it's nice to just have a visual for things. Um, being aware of your voice volume is also important. Um, you know, asking the client if it's too loud or too soft on that end. Again, I know we're all trying to protect um, you know, confidentiality at this time. And if we don't know who's on the other end, we may be raising or lowering our voice and not really being aware of it. Um, also during the sessions, you may wanna consider um, breaking up some of your sessions. I know that many folks are used to doing our 45 or 60 minute sessions, um, but keeping in mind that again, like that Zoom fatigue is real. Um, so it might be nice really to cut it down to more like 20 or 25 minute sessions and even doing them twice a week. Um, I think that's a great technique also um, if you're doing CBT because you're able to introduce a skill, practice it, and then follow up on that homework that you might give later on in the week. And again, that, that those 20 or 25 minute sessions might just be more appropriate for our little ones. Um, in building rapport, we've mentioned some of these things, um, you know, but it might be nice also to allow um, your client um, or the caregiver to create a bin or a pile of things that they want to share. When our client or caregiver is at home, a lot of times, you know, kids want to show you every stuffed animal that they have and every game that they have at home. So you could create that bin sort of as a parking lot that you might have done in in-person sessions and just say, yeah, we'd love to see it. You know, I, you know, I really want to see what you want to share with me. Let's put it in the bin. And at the end, you can pull out whatever you'd like to show me for the last five minutes. As I mentioned, there are tons of free online games. Um, you can use these links, you can send them to clients, and then you can actually interact online to play that game. Um, so check out all of these things. We're gonna be sharing the PowerPoint and so you can click on the links. And as you're starting out teletherapy, make sure that you're giving tips to the students and the caregivers. Everything that we said to you earlier today about you being able to plug in um, and you being prepared, again, coaching our students and our caregivers through that. Um, one of the things I, one of the tips I really like to give, um, especially for our little ones or just our, our students that have a hard time sitting still, um, is building some kind of stand, um, especially if they're using a cell phone. So a lot of times you'll be going on an unintentional tour as they walk you through the home, they're on the phone and they're just all over the place. Um, so you could use like a tissue bat box or, you know, even like some Play-Doh, um, they had Play-Doh at home to make a stand something so that you can start to um, train a client to be in one place as you're doing the session. When we're talking about privacy and confidentiality, um, just as we're in, when we're in session um, in person, you know, make sure you're always reviewing standard confidentiality. We talked about asking about who's in the home um, and if there's anybody else in the, um, the home that might walk into sessions. And consider depending on your state laws. Um, you know, I know in Maryland, some of our clients, if they're 16 or older, they may be involved in therapy and their, their parents or caregivers do not know. Um, so you're gonna have to work that out. Um, you know, when are they gonna talk to you? Where are they gonna be? It's gonna be important to wear headphones. Um, and even with our teenagers, um, it's really nice to use the chat function sometimes um, if you're not able to speak, if somebody walks into the room. Informed consent and confidentiality are very important. Again, I know there's been a lot of concerns about safety on telemental health. Um, so it's really important to discuss with the client and caregiver all of the risks, benefits, and limitations of teletherapy. Um, also cover the, the student or the caregiver's right to withdrawal or you know, your right to refer them to somewhere in person um, if you feel like it's not safe enough for them to be in a teletherapy session. One of the things we're doing here with our program is making sure that we have at least one to two emergency contacts in place and making sure that those are readily available in case something should come up. Um, but I would even increase that number. I, you know, you may even need like three or four emergency contacts, um, depending on the way that you're providing services and where. Um, we know during virtual learning um, and when folks aren't, um, you know, going places and doing most stuff virtual, that they are also traveling. So some people are using this time to take vacations or maybe they're staying with an aunt or an uncle or 
you know, a neighbor while a parent works, um, you know, during the day. And if that's when you're having your session, you want to make sure that you have that release of information um, and the emergency contact information for whoever is with the child. Um, so always ask where they are, you know, what location they're in and who is with them and making sure that you have that, um, you have that release. I think we mentioned um, you know, some of this, all the emergency information, but also um, make sure that if you do have students that are you know, higher risk or you know that they've had some suicidal ideation in the past, you wanna make sure that you're developing a safety plan um, you know, right off the bat. And to be honest, I recommend to a lot of my clinicians that we really develop a safety plan for all of our clients, um, just in case something comes up. We know that during COVID, a lot of our students um, are more isolated, they're experiencing more anxiety and, they're, and also more depression. And so a child that you may think is stable and hasn't historically had any issues of suicidal ideation, you wanna make sure that you know, they have a, a, a toolbox and you have a safety plan in place just in case something comes up. And it's important to be discussing that with the client and the caregiver. In starting your sessions with um, caregivers and clients, it's also really important when you're building that trust um, and building that therapeutic um, alliance and rapport there to remind students and families that sessions are not recorded. Um, I'll even go so far in one of the first sessions to you know, show them if I hit the record button, this is what happens. Um, you, know, you would know there's a red light. A lot of times there's a voice that comes out up that says the session's being recorded. Um, just so that they can, they can feel comfortable that nothing is being recorded. And then I also have a conversation where I ask them not to record me in any way. Um, just to make sure, you know, a lot of, you know, folks can pick up their phone and record something and we don't know about it. Um, and we want to review that confidentiality and that trust that we're trying to build between each other. We've talked about orient and orienting clients to spaces, um, but also determine um, I like to determine with the clients um, some sort of special signal. Um, so I don't know, touching your nose, wiggling your ear, something like that, in case the space that they thought was private um, then becomes not so confidential or not private. So like if you're in the room and a, a, another caregiver or somebody walks through or a sibling and the child wants to stop talking about whatever's going on, they can you know, very quickly touch your nose rather than saying like, oh my gosh, stop, we can't talk in front of grandma right now. Um, it just gives them an easy way out. And um, I'm always gonna be monitoring for that signal once we come up with it. Um, make sure that you've, you've also introduced telemental health very clearly about what it is and what the expectations are. Um, as we mentioned, the comfortability with um, providers is not as much with clients. So you know, when you're explaining it, be really confident about it. Even though if you're, you know, shaking a little bit in your boots, you know, be confident, present it with, you know, no anxiety when you're explaining it so that your families and your um, clients can feel comfortable with it. Um, as I mentioned, pay attention for those nonverbal cues. Um, you don't want to miss it if they did give you a, a clue and they want to stop, you know, and transition either to the chat or um, just to a different topic until that person leaves the room. Um, also just be modern if, they, if you haven't developed that, that, that signal, um, you know, trying to see if a client has something like maybe they just look off a little bit, you know, and you're wondering what's going on and you want to stop and ask, hey, you know, it looks like something just changed in the last couple of minutes. Um, you know, do we need to stop? You know, you know, should you send them a note in the chat real quick to say, hey, is everything okay? Um, just to make sure because they might kind of freeze up if somebody walks in the room or might forget about your signal and you want to again make sure you're building a therapeutic alliance and trying to maintain that confidentiality as much as possible. Um, it, again as we mentioned there's small glitches that may happen if they do happen in technology try to ride that wave out but if there are larger technical issues make sure that you stop and address them um, and make sure that you're using online resources as appropriate. I've embedded a couple of resources throughout here, um, but this is a great one. This is a TFCBT online resources. If you click on there, it'll a link to um, several, several skills and um, you can use them in TFCBT as well as other sessions. Okay, and in ending the session, make sure that you leave time to transition. Um, include the caregivers if that's what your plan had been laid out to be um, and ask for feedback. You know, 
as all of us are new to doing this in some way, shape or form or getting more comfortable with it, you know, ask your clients and your caregivers, what did you like about the session? You know, did you like the game that we used? Did you like the conversations we had? Did you like the use of, you know, any of the online features that might have been available that you used that day? Um, so that you can tailor next sessions um, to see what will be most beneficial to your client. Um, also make sure that you're planning for the next time. Uh, when is your next session? What materials do you need? Um, and who will attend? And always try to end on a positive statement by letting your client, your caregiver know what they did well um, so that you can start positively the next time. Supervision is so important during this time. Um, we know that a lot of folks are new um, or just using tele-mental health more frequently now. Um, so make sure that you're reaching out for support. Um, you're supporting trainees through this, through supervision and coaching, um, that you're seeking peer-to-peer -peer supervision. And you know, you're doing all of this again with the goal of increasing your comfort level with this practice of telemental health. Also be sure, um, as we mentioned, you know, you need a business associate agreement, things like that. You know, things are changing with telemental health, and a lot of times they're changing very quickly. So make sure you're checking with and reviewing your federal, state, and board regulations frequently, um, just to make sure that you're following all of the guidelines that are expected. And um, a lot of times this applies to billing too, so make sure you're following all the billing procedures. And as we mentioned, make sure you have that business associate agreement, um, you know, and, and confirm that this is um, that your platform is approved by your provider or your agency. Okay, so um, that was a lot of tier one stuff, but again, they can all be applied to tier two and tier, or tier three stuff, I apologize. Um, but a lot of those strategies can be applied throughout the tiers. Um, so now that we've thoroughly discussed tier three, let's look at a couple of the other tiers. Um, so many, like I said, many of them are going to overlap, um, you know, but when we're talking about tier two, a lot of times we're talking about some of our groups. Um, so some of our small group interventions like coping power, incredible years, anger coping, bot bins, why try. So keep, keep an eye out because a lot of those groups, um, they are putting out on their websites how they, modif how they are modifying things for Tela. And so you can get a lot of um, tips and tricks from them directly as they're trying things out and modifying their own programs. Um, so in the meanwhile, again, just trying to maintain routines where you can, um, as they apply to in-person therapy, um, consider how to best adapt the structure of some of those groups and interventions, um, considering timelines um, or, or timing of sessions. You know, um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, you may be able to split up sessions into like 20 minutes rather than two 20 minutes rather than doing your 40 or 60 minutes. Um, making sure you're checking with those web platforms and also considering confidentiality um, in tier two and tier three. I love to share this one. This is a, a great tier two activity and it is com it's completely free if you haven't seen it before. It's called the We Do Listen Foundation. Um, this one's a little bit for, you, for little ones. Um, so probably like kindergarten first and second. Um, but it's a great resource and you can use it and you can share it um, with your clients. There's lots of books and songs. Um, there's lessons on there that you can use. Um, it's all based on this um, bunny, Howard B. Wigglebottom, um, who you know, has some hyperactive tendencies and gets into lots of trouble. So it's a great way to share a video, have a discussion, practice a skill. Um, as we talk about tier one strategies, again, all the strategies that you're using maybe for like a whole school, um, our clinicians have been really successful in this area um, because we're sharing a lot of things on the school-based platform. So, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, some folks use like Class Dojo, or I, you know, I don't know what else you might have, but there's all kinds of different um, school systems and school platforms that you can use to get out mental health information. And a lot of our families are going to those platforms now. So consider using them and talking to your school to see if you can um, put information out there. So we're doing um, weekly, weekly wellness newsletters for school staff and for families. Again, so we're also supporting those lower um, or bottom tiers. Um, integrating the social emotional curriculum onto online classes. And I know that teachers have been pretty successful in doing this. I've seen it you know, with my own kids um, using like conscious discipline, you know, going through all of the um, different coping strategies and breathing strategies. 
And those social and emotional related videos, they are great too, because not only can you use them, um, you know, in talking about like tier one, but a lot of times you can use them in tier two and tier three by just modifying them a little bit. Um, so important to also hold some sort of office hours while we're telling, while we're virtual and schools are closed. We need to let our families and teachers and clients know when they can reach us um, and having that open time for folks to be able to pop in um, or schedule an appointment so that they can check in if they're having a concern. As I mentioned already, using the other platforms and connecting with families and training and informing staff of your new referral mechanisms. So um, when we're in person, a lot of times, you know, we can, um, you know, we're there, we can reach out to teachers very quickly, um, but, you know, we might have to work a little bit harder to remind them that we are here. I'm just sharing this um, for later, but if anybody needed that, um, this is something that we put out early um, on in COVID just to help folks stay in a routine and, um, you know, just, a, just an easy tool. Um, also tier one in the classroom, there are, ton, there are a couple other free programs. I don't have a lot of, I know I'm quickly running out of time here, um, but check these out. We do listen, teaching tolerance, um, closed gap, um, excellent resources. Closed gap is something that you can have a, a group or even a whole classroom of students log on to, and then they could log on to it each day. Um, you know, note how they're doing. Um, there's places for them to ask for help from an adult or do some self-guided activities. It's an amazing free um, program. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy. Thank you, Jen. I'm just gonna quickly yeah. highlight some resources and do wanna mention we're, you know, of course, very focused on student mental health, but we, you cannot take care of student mental health if you are not also considering our educators. They're under a lot of stress as well, especially now with trying to teach in, often in a hybrid model or in person or you know, completely virtually. There's just some new stressors. And these are just some resources that we recommend for, to support teacher well-being. Headspace um, is a great resource. Our mental health um, tech, technology transfer center tools for educators. A wise teaching workbook. These are all some great resources. You can follow the links that we have. Um, move, moving to the next slide, we wanted to highlight um, okay, yep. some, these are some guidance and scripts and strategies specifically for educators and really give some practical hands-on um, language of what to say, how to address this. Here are some resources when educators are working with students who have some mental health concerns. School family community partnerships. We need to make sure that the community is aware of what school mental health services are available, but also that we're aware of what's available within the community and that we have access to the available um, supports that families can access, whether it's hotline, crisis response, and other um, resources. Family, here's a list of some family resources that can be helpful, especially for parents to use. And some hot national hotline numbers that it's important to share as well. There's a lot that's written about telemental health and here are some resources from the National Council for Behavioral Health that they had put together. We highly recommend if you wanna learn more to check these out. And um, if you did not get enough of Jen, she does a fantastic job. There's also a telemental health 101 um, video that she has recorded that's available on our website. And here are some other toolkits, including, I did want to mention those, you know, some resources specific for rural communities as well related to telemental health. And with that, here are some references for our presentation today. And we really thank you for allowing us to present to you all today. Thank you so much, Jen and Nancy. And we just have one question that has come um, up during the talk, it, and they ask, is it too personal to give a tour of your current office if it's your bedroom? <laughs> yeah, I would consider what you want to share. Um, yeah, I don't think that I would share my bedroom. Um, but you know, if you're just able to just very, sometimes you could, you know, like if there was a bed in this room, I could just kind of quickly go around and see the walls, and you haven't yeah. been able to see the mess that's on the floor or the bed that might be over there. Um, you know, to be very strategic about it, and right. you know, it allows us. Do that. Yeah, show your book spell. Show, you know, think of yes. you can practice beforehand with another colleague and 
just see like, you know, how you can angle and what you can share. So you can share your corner. It may not necessarily be your whole room. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much. We really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to working with you again. Thank you so much, Jessica. You. Take care, everyone. Bye.